الرحمن الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم كن لوليك الحجة ابن الحسن صلواتك عليه وعلى آبائه في هذه الساعة وفي كل ساعة وليا وحافظا وقائدا وناصرا ودليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه أرضك طوعا وتمتعه فيها طويلا اللهم هب لنا رأفته ورحمته وعونه ودعاءه وخيره ورضاه ما ننال به سعة من رحمتك وفوزا عندك يا كريم برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين On this eve of Friday, a special salam to Aba Abdullah al Hussein all together at once. Assalamu alayka ya Aba Abdullah wa ala al arwah alati halat bifinaik. عليك مني سلام الله أبدا ما بقيت وبقي الليل والنهار ولا جعله الله آخر العهد مني لزيارتكم السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين وعلى أبي الفضل العباس بن أمير المؤمنين قال الله العظيم في محكم كتابه الكريم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله اتقوا الله وكونوا مع الصادقين آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم. For the hastening of the reappearance of the Master, the Savior, the Avenger, Al Hujjat ibn Al Hasan Al Askari, recite aloud salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. to receive the intercession of the mother of Imam al Hussein, Fatima al-Zahra on the day of judgment recite another loud salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad <laughs> to be raised in paradise in the company of Aba Abdullah al Hussein and his family and companions and even louder third salawat Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. One of the places where prayers are answered, where the gateways of heaven are opened, where God hears us, is these gatherings held to commemorate the tragedy of Aba Abdullah al Hussein. The Majalis of Hussein are among what we call Madanul Ijabah. 
It's those places where your heart breaks, where your tears roll down your cheek, where your love for the vicegerents of God, for the family of Rasulullah, for the ones whose love is mandated in the literal text of the Quran, that love is real and it's authentic and it's genuine. And you could see it, you could feel it. There's an outpour of emotion. This happens in these gatherings, which is what makes them so special. And it's because of that, that in these gatherings and on such a holy and special night, it's important that we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes this year, which began just a couple of days ago, the year of the reappearance of the master. May this be the time when God's promise is fulfilled. May this be the year where the prophecies of God's messengers and apostles finally comes to fruition, inshallah. It's important that we make this dua for the sake of the Savior himself. To pray for him, not just that he comes back and helps us or anything like that, but just for him to find relief. For the family of Rasulullah to finally, for the first time ever, find some peace. Because this nation betrayed Rasulullah and his family. It's like they say, I'm sure you've heard this before, and it's not just this statement. This is the truth. And I challenge anyone to show me otherwise. Had the Prophet said, I want you to oppress my family, wallahi, they couldn't have done a better job. Had the Prophet advised his nation to go hunt down his children and his progeny and slaughter them one after the other, they couldn't have done it any worse than they did. The family of Rasulullah, every last single one of them, the Imams of the Ahlul Bayt, these were by the admission of their enemies, their foes, by the admission of their contemporaries, the admission of the leaders of other schools of thought, they were always the best of the best. Every single one of them, there are testimonies from ulama of other denominations as well as the ruling elite that would speak of the merits and virtues of every single one of these Imams. You'll find this statement being reiterated over and over again about each member of the Ahlul Bayt, and yet every single one of them was killed. This nation betrayed the Holy Prophet. This nation failed to compensate the Prophet for his hard work and toil. قُلْ لَا أَسْأَلُكُمْ عَلَيْهِ أَجْرًا إِلَّا الْمَوَدَّةَ فِي الْقُرْبَةَ And yet this is how they repay Rasulullah. Only 50 years after the passing of the Holy Prophet, Karbala, the single greatest calamity in all of human history took place. Within half a century, is this قُلْ لَا أَسْأَلُكُمْ عَلَيْهِ أَجْرًا إِلَّا الْمَوَدَّةَ فِي الْقُرْبَةَ is this how you repay Rasulullah? Or perhaps it is by threatening to burn down the house of the daughter of Rasulullah within days of his death. Or perhaps it's by fighting Ali ibn Abi Talib, the brother of Rasulullah, the one the Prophet kept for himself when people were paired up, all of the companions. Ahmad ibn Hanbal says this in his Musnad. Look at these ahadith. He paired people up. This one with that one, this one with that one. Amir al-Mu'mineen was the last person. And so he came to the Holy Prophet. He said to him, Ya Rasulullah, look at the language. Look at the relationship. He said to him, Ya Rasulullah, if I've done anything to upset you, if I've made a mistake, then I am begging you to forgive me because you are right and I am wrong. But if I haven't done anything, I've been sitting here longing to have someone 
become my brother in this fraternal bond. Rasulullah looked at him, he said, Ya Ali, Wallahi maddakhartuka illa li nafsi. I have not saved you except for myself. No one else can be your brother other than God's final messenger. I've kept you from me, Ya Ali. Then he said to him, again in Musnad Ahmad, he said to him, Anta minni bimanzilati Haruna min Musa. إِلَّا أَنَّهُ لَا نَبِيَّ بَعْدِي وَأَنْتَ وَارِثُ عِلْمِي يَا عَلِي You are the one to whom I will inherit my knowledge. The sad thing is we read these statements and we just, we don't really ponder, we don't think what the Prophet is saying. Partly because we don't care enough. Partly because so many other fabricated traditions were manufactured on mass by Muawiyah and his cronies, that it simply diluted the real authentic virtues of the family of Rasulullah. So it's important that we pray in these nights, and especially tonight, for this final vicegerent of Rasulullah, the promised one, the twelfth one. Because when you pray for him, wouldn't he also pray for you? If somebody said to me that I, I'm praying for you, my natural instinctive response is what? As I will for you, right? That's the courteous thing to do. That's the kind thing to do. Now imagine, you pray for him. He doesn't pray for you? Of course he does. Somebody came to Imam Ridha, alayhi alafu tahiyyati wassalam, he said to him, Ya Rasulullah, Udu'li. O son of the Messenger of God, pray for me. So the Imam asked him a question. He said to him, Don't you think I pray for you? So he said, I stopped, I paused for a second to think about what the Imam just asked me. So I said to myself that I am one of his followers, he is my leader. So surely he cares enough about me to pray for me. So he turns around to the imam and he says to him, yes, I think you do pray for me. The imam said, of course I do. I pray for you every day. Then the imam gave him a test. He said, you have in my heart the position that I have in your heart. If you truly follow me, if you truly care for me, if you truly love me, if you honor me, then you should know that I care for you and love you and honor you even more so. Which is why Imam al-Ridha is quoted as saying, Man zarani fi ghurbati wa ala bu'di dari. May Allah grant us his visitation. Whoever comes to visit me in my loneliness, in that strange land, all the Ahlul Bayt, they always felt connected to none other than Medina al Rasul. And so whenever they left Medina, they felt like strangers. What they did, what did they do to you? That Hussein ibn Fatima ibn Rasulullah would have to be displaced and be turned into a refugee from the land of Rasulullah, from the city that was associated with his grandfather. So the Imam says that whoever comes to visit me, our eighth Imam, Zurtuhu fi thalathi mawatin. I will visit him in three places. Imagine like you're traveling to a country, a very strange land, a place you've never been to, but you happen to have a powerful friend, someone who lives there, someone who knows the local culture, knows the language. He also happens to be, let's say, a minister or someone who's high profile and is quite powerful. Now imagine that person tells you, listen, come and I'll look after you. I'll come and meet you at the airport. I'll pick you up myself. How special is that? Imam al Ridha says, Whoever visits me, ala bu'di dari wa ghurbati, zurtuhu fi thalathi mawatin, I will visit him 
in these three stations, which are by far the most difficult of all. He said, number one, when the books containing our actions and our deeds, when on judgment day they distribute the report cards, people are terrified. People don't know what their fate is going to be, what their report cards will contain. I will meet you there. I will come and visit you the way you visited me. Then the Imam says, وَعِنْدَ الصِّرَاطِ وَعِنْدَ الْمِيزَانِ I will be there when your actions are being placed on the scales to know whether you have more good deeds or more sins. I will be there to help you, to look out for you. And finally, on the sirat that connects the valley or the desert where people gather to face their judgment and their reckoning and paradise. And underneath, you have the fires of hell. The Imam says, I will be there for you. I will be there asking my grandfather Rasulullah to intercede for you. So if the Imam prays for you and comes to help you and intercedes for you in these three critical places just because you visited his shrine, don't you think that when you pray for your living Imam that he will also reciprocate and then some? So, this is why we're told by the Imam himself in his letter, فَأَكْثِرُ الدُّعَاءَ بِتَعْجِيلِ الْفَرَجِ فَإِنَّ ذَلِكَ فَرَجَكُمْ So pray for relief to come, for in doing so, you will receive your own relief. Pray for divine intervention. Pray for this pain and misery to come to an end. Seek Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, beseech him, plead with him, and your relief will come even before those events transpire. Meaning that by simply praying for the Imam, your life will become easier. That's how it works. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will solve whatever problems you're going through because you're turning to him, because you're praying to Allah for relief to come. That's why it's critical, brothers and sisters, that we pray. Now, we're dealing with someone who even if we neglect him, even if we fail to pray for him, even if we fail to remember him, he never fails to do so. He says to us, Shaykh al-Mufid in his letter, and he wrote multiple letters, but in this particular one, he says, فَإِنَّا لَسْنَا نَاسِينَ لِذِكْرِكُمْ وَلَا مُهْمِلِينَ لِمُرَاعَاتِكُمْ وَلَوْلَا ذَلِكْ لَأَخَذَتْكُمُ الْلَأْوَاءِ وَاسْطَلَمَكُمُ الْأَعْدَاءِ He said, you should know that we never forget about you. We always pray for you. We always look after you. And had it not been for that, you would have been uprooted by your enemies. You would have been exterminated by your foes. Had it not been for his attention, for his prayers. So inshallah, tonight is the night to do that. Muharram is a season of transformation. It's a time where we make big decisions. It's a time where we anchor our boats to that of Aba Abdullah al Hussein. Al Husseinu, as the Holy Prophet said, Al Husseinu Safina to Najat, Misbahu Hudan wa Safina to Najat. This is the time where these habits, inshallah, are developed and refined so that we can maximize the benefits and we could seek salvation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. We said last night that the ultimate aim and objective in this life of confusion among all of these misconceptions, this confusing labyrinth that we find ourselves in the midst of. In such a world where everybody has opened a shop and they're selling their products in the form of ideas and thoughts and means with which they claim they're selling snake oil at the end of the day. Everybody is claiming that I am the truth, I have the truth, you should follow me. And yet we know for a fact that the truth 
cannot be self-contradictory. Statements that contradict each other are mutually exclusive, right? Either Jesus is God or he is not God. It can't be both. This extreme form of philosophical perennialism or what's called uh, with different names, pluralism or whatever you would like to call it, this is unsustainable. It's illogical. It's self-contradictory. So you have all of these different claims, each one saying something. In this world, you need to be with who? With the ones that Rasulullah said you should be with them. Say it louder. Or according to other versions of the hadith, and it makes a big difference. But we'll leave that for another time. The Holy Prophet said, you wish to avoid deviation? After me, there is going to be discord, there's going to be fitna, there's going to be schisms, there's going to be conflicts, there's going to be death, carnage, and destruction. Rasulullah knew all these things. So he's giving us a solution. He's giving us the medicine to treat this disease. He says, I'm leaving with you the Holy Quran, Hablun Mamdudun Ma Baina Samai Wal Ard and my progeny, and my kindred, and my family. Because if you take the Qur'an all by itself, the Qur'an is a malleable text. The Qur'an is flexible. You can bend it, you can twist it, you can misinterpret it whichever way you want. That's why ISIS uses the Qur'an, cites the Qur'an to justify their atrocities. And the Sufis do it, and the Salafis do it, and the, everybody has some kind of claim to the Quran. Even the, I remember my father says that back in the 1960s in Iraq, the communist party in Iraq would hold banners citing verses of the Quran. So the communists who didn't believe in God, they also cite verses of the Quran. The Khawarij used to cite verses of the Quran. The Mariqeen used to cite verses of the Qur'an. Literally everyone is going to use verses of the Qur'an to justify their actions. So the Qur'an alone is not enough. The Qur'an needs an arbiter. It needs a standard by which it could be measured. You need some kind of way to decode the language of the Qur'an. So what did the Prophet leave us with? The Ahlul Bayt. Aitrati Ahlul Bayt. Muatta Malik says... وسنتي. Literally every other Musnad and Sahih says عطرتي. But the one who reports the traditions from Malik ibn Anas in his Muatta, قال راوي المواطة, the Prophet said, I'm leaving you with the Quran and my tradition. Well, how's that turning out? The Quran and the Prophet's Sunnah, has it solved our problems? The chaos that we see in the world today, in the Muslim world. How has that been addressed by the fact that you have the Quran and the so-called Sunnah of the Prophet? The Sunnah of the Prophet is contradictory. The Sunnah of the Prophet is all over the place. Ultimately, you have a means with which you get to the Sunnah of the Prophet. You don't have a direct access to Rasulullah now, do you? So you have to go through the companions. And don't even get me started on the companions and their inconsistencies and their contradictions and their killing of each other. I mean, if that's not a contradiction, I don't know what is. So how do you verify the sunnah of the prophet? The Quran doesn't need verification, but the Quran needs interpretation. So whichever way you turn, you've reached a dead end. There's no way this would solve our problems. It creates more problems than it solves. You need to go back to the family of Rasulullah, the ones in whose house the Qur'an was revealed. 
The family of the prophet, the ones who were raised by the messenger of God, the ones he pointed to, the ones he brought together and recited the verse, إِنَّمَا يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ لِيُذْهِبَ عَنْكُمُ الرِّجْسَ أَهْلَ الْبَيْتِ وَيُطَهِّرَكُمْ تَطْهِيرًا Six. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. Six or seven linguistic tools to add emphasis in this verse. I don't want to get into it right now. All this emphasis about the purity of the Ahlul Bayt can only mean one thing, that they're infallible, that they're inerrant. In fact, even if we didn't have this verse, Hadith al-Thaqalain proves without question the infallibility of the Ahlul Bayt. How? When Rasulullah associates these two together and says that they will never separate, if the Quran is infallible, which of course it is, then so are the ones linked to it and will never separate from it. If they committed a single minor sin, then they would separate from the Quran, wouldn't they? The Prophet says they will never separate until they come back to me by the pond on the day of judgment. That hadith in itself is proof of the infallibility of the family of Rasulullah. <laughs> so then of course you have people who come and tell you as we said last night if Hussein knew that these Kufans would betray him why would they do that and so the natural inclination here is to deny the fact that he was aware of what would happen the idea here is to take away the most obvious of facts and somehow portray Imam al Hussein as someone who was at best confused, wasn't sure what would happen, he had the best of intentions as the grand mufti of the vile Saudi regime said on television, Al Hussein Ghurra Bih. He was deceived, he was taken. Astaghfirullah, I don't want to use his words. Hussein didn't really quiet compute what was happening. Didn't know that this would end in disaster the way it did. They fooled him, right? And so that's how it's presented. But then as I said, leave aside the religious arguments, Right? Even if you don't believe in their infallibility and in the fact that they are heirs to the Prophet and the fact that they are inheritors to the Prophet's knowledge, the fact that the Prophet himself spoke about the tragedy of Karbala, the fact that it was well known, literally everyone knew it. Leave all that aside. Anyone with a modicum of geopolitical awareness knew that this was not going to end in anything other than the martyrdom of Hussein and his family. Everybody knew that. But what they fail to appreciate or understand or accept is that Hussein is not here to become king no matter the cost. That's not the idea. If it was about becoming king and deposing the filthy animal that Yazid was, when at the very least, when At-Tarimah, who was one of the companions of Imam Al-Hasan and the companions of Amir Al-Mu'mineen, encountered Imam Al-Hussein along the way, he said to him, come to Yemen, Ya Aba Abdullah. Why are you going to Kufa knowing the Kufan society and how they think? Come with me to Yemen. I have a tribe of 30,000 people. I guarantee they will all join you and fight for your cause. At the very least, when you have an offer you can't refuse like that, you would accept it if the objective was what? To depose this tyrant and to replace him. But that's not the idea. Imam al Hussein's mission is guidance. Political authority, if accessible, if available, is, and if it's a means to provide guidance, then why not? But that is a means to an end. The end here is guidance. 
Imam al Hussein wants to expose the vile character of Yazid and Bani Umayyah. Imam al Hussein wants to say that this entire system is corrupt to the very core. Imam al Hussein wants to remind us, and again, all it needs is just a little reflection. You don't need to be a rocket scientist. Just think about it for a moment. Who paved the way for Yazid to ascend the pulpit of Rasulullah? Who paved the way for a filthy drunkard like Yazid? Yazid, Sharib al Khumur, Raqib al Fujur, Qatil al Nafs al Muhtarama. Imam al Hussein describes him like this. Everybody knows who Yazid was. The Imam said, This kind of man? The guy with pet monkeys sitting on the pulpit of Rasulullah, who made that possible for him? What were the events that led up to that? Which is why we say, Allahumma al'an awwala zalimin zalama haqqa Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad wa akhira tabi'an lahu ala thalik. Whoever paved the way has to be held to account. Whoever created an environment that's conducive for someone like Yazid to sit on the throne has to be held to account because they knew exactly what they were doing. The aberration, the deviation began a long time ago. Which is why Lady Zainab, as part of her eulogy of her brother who, whose body was left on the plains of Karbala, mutilated, and battered, one of the statements she makes is Assalamu ala qatil al-ithnayn or the one who was killed on Monday. Which doesn't make sense because Imam al-Hussein was killed on a Friday. Ashura, by and large, most accounts say that it happened on a Friday. What is Zainab trying to tell us here? No, 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 no. Yes, you were martyred on the on Friday, but you were truly killed on Monday. The day Rasulullah was killed. The day Rasulullah left this world. Because that's when the deviation began. That's when the oppression was kick-started. And then you have people who come and tell you, oh, you know, we have to... The problem with the Kufans was this, my dear brothers and sisters. Listen carefully. Last night I talked about the Kufans and the parallels between the people of Kufa and the problems that we're facing in this very moment. Because there are so many similarities. There's so much common ground. It's, it's terrifying how similar today's society is in comparison to the society of the Kufans at the time. I swear to God, it's terrifying. It sends shivers down my spine. Because I, I look and I see all the hallmarks of what created the massacre of Ashura. One of which, for example, was the fact that the Kufans didn't want to rock the boat. And I, mentioned, I alluded to this last night. The fact that they were happy where they were. They were doing just fine. They didn't want to get into some kind of conflict that would involve any form of fighting or, you know, even if it took more than just having to go out and welcome Imam al Hussein, they couldn't be bothered with all that. They wanted wellness, they wanted comfort, they wanted convenience. One of the ways with which Ubaidillah ibn Ziyad alayhi la'a'inullah ibn Marjana was able to tip the balance, tip the scales in his favor, was tapping into this issue. So let me, let me paint the picture for you here, right? When Ubaidillah was summoned by Yazid, Yazid realized that Kufa was going to turn. So, because he had learned that letters had been sent inviting Imam al-Hussein to come and whatnot. So, Yazid sent after Ubaidillah, his governor in Basra. He said to him, listen, come to Kufa as soon as you possibly can, because we need to bring things under control. When Ubaidillah came, he was wearing a mask so that no one would recognize him. He was too afraid to come in a hostile environment, or at least he perceived it to be a hostile environment. So he was all covered up, he was wearing a mask, he came with a handful of people. 
whoever saw him assumed that he was Imam al Hussein. In fact, Ubaidullah bin Ziyad's fears were intensified by the fact that whoever saw him would say, Assalamu alayka, Ibn Rasulullah. He realized that everybody was anticipating Imam al Hussein to come. But what he did was, he didn't say a thing, he simply went straight to the governor's mansion, to the government house, and he snuck in. At first, the former governor wouldn't want to let him in. He said to him, Ya Hussein, again, the former governor thought that uh, Ubaidullah was Imam al Hussein. He said to him, Ya Aba Abdullah, please don't make me do anything. Please don't make me kill you. I don't want to have to kill you. So Ubaidullah removed his mask. He's like, listen, it's me. Let me in before somebody kills me. So he snuck in with a bunch of people and then he sealed the gates of the governor's mansion because news quickly spread that this was in fact not Imam al Hussein but Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad and now he felt physically threatened. When Muslim ibn Aqil, and inshallah we'll talk about him in a subsequent night because his mission was one of the most important ones in the entire saga of Imam al Hussein. His role was incredibly instrumental. Salamullahi alayhi. When Muslim ibn Aqil, they had decided on a code word that once this code word was uh, said, everyone in Kufa would assemble and they would be ready to fight. When Muslim ibn Aqil uttered the code word, Ya Mansuru Emit, this was the code word. When he said it early morning after Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad had gone into the governor's mansion, they say thousands of Kufans came out wielding their swords. Sallu ala Muhammad wa So, how do you go from that <clears throat> to what happened to Muslim Ibn Aqil only a few days after? Do you know what happened? <coughs> One of the things that Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad did was that he sent some of his people, some of his troops, soldiers, to get the word out that there is going to be a war. And if, he, if anyone is found on the wrong side of this war, meaning if anyone supports Muslim <coughs> and supports Imam al Hussein, the first thing we will do is that we will cut off their monthly stipends. So the Muslim government had a system by which they would pay allowances, uh, you know, some kind of payment that they would give. He said, we will cut that off. Most of the people of Kufa backed away because of that threat. What does that tell you about these people? They had given their pledges, their allegiance. They had promised Imam al Hussein, "Inna taqdimu ala jundin mujannada." We are all soldiers for you. And yet, all of a sudden, mothers started coming to their sons, saying, "Son, listen, they're going to stop paying this, paying us this monthly allowance. Please, let's go home. We don't want any trouble." Over a little petty cash. Again, compare that to how most people lead their lives. The central tenet of most decisions that people make is money. It's how much money we can make, how much of an income do I expect. When it comes to choosing their careers, when it comes to choosing where to study, when it comes to choosing where to live, when it comes to choosing who to marry, when it comes to choose all these things, they revolve around what? money and so if our income is disturbed in any way then you can expect a lot of defections Imam al Hussein himself said on the day of Ashura he said most people are not bothered by religion religion is but saliva in their mouths they use this saliva 
to wet the dry inner linings of their mouths and as soon as they want nothing to do with it, they'll spit it out. To most people, religion is just that. It's a means of lubricating their lives. It's a means of making their lives more comfortable. وَإِذَا مُحِصُوا بِالْبَلَاءَ قَلَّ الدَّيَّانُونَ And yet, when the push comes to the shove, when they're being tested, you will find that most people do not hold on to religious values. You'll find that most people couldn't be bothered. They'll quickly sneak out, like many of the people who abandoned Imam al Hussein on the way to Karbala. This is the reality, brothers and sisters. So that's one of the problems of the Kufans. I'll try and wrap up quickly. The other problem that they had, listen carefully to this, was the fact that they were not theologically stable. What does that mean? It means that, you know how sometimes people tr try to keep their options open, right? They're like, listen, we love everybody. Everybody is good. Everybody's cool. Let's not rock the boat. Let's not cause any problems. But see, again, as I said earlier, there are some serious inconsistencies. You can't just love everybody. This whole idea about Adalat al Sahaba, that all of the companions are somehow good and immune from criticism, and that they all will end up in paradise. How do you reconcile that with the fact that they murdered each other? With the fact that they caused so much carnage and destruction against each other. How do you reconcile that with the battle of Jamal, 30,000 dead? How do you reconcile that with the battle of Safin that lasted four months until some were saying, and uh, 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 they made a statement, in Qarab al Arab, that the Arabs have, as, are going to become extinct? That's how many people have died. How do you reconcile that with the fact that the third Khalifa exiles Abu Dharin al-Ghifari, Ridwanullahi ta'ala alayhi, this great companion of Rasulullah about whom the Prophet said that the heavens has not cast its shadow on anyone more truthful than Abu Dhar. And he gets exiled and he dies of hunger and thirst on the way. How do you reconcile all that? Yes, I know these are inconvenient truths. I know the easy thing to do is to simply shut our minds off of all of this and say, oh, no, 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 they were all good. And if anyone dares criticize, then they are rafidis, they are kuffar. So, the problem that the Kufans had was that they liked to keep their options open. Someone came to our sixth Imam, Ja'far ibn Muhammad al Sadiq alayhi salam. <coughs> And he said to him, Ya ibn Rasulullah, I am one of those people who's all about peace and love and harmony. So I love everybody. I love you, I really do. Remember when we said that it's a, it's a two-part process. أَسْأَلُ اللَّهَ الَّذِي أَكْرَمَنِي بِمَعْرِفَتِكُمْ وَمَعْرِفَةِ أَوْلِيَائِكُمْ وَرَزَقَنِي الْبَرَاءَةَ مَنْ أَعْدَائِكُمْ God, the one who gave me your love and who also sustained me with enmity towards your foes. I ask him to make me with you in this world and the next. That's how you can achieve that oneness, that togetherness with those who are truthful. Ya Sadiqeen, if you're going to be with the truthful ones, then you have to reject the who? Those who are not truthful. Those who are liars. Those who are cheaters. Those who are sinners. You stick with the truthful ones, right? That togetherness can only be achieved if you maintain this two-part process. Love for them, enmity towards their enemies. It's in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Ayatul Kursi, He says, You have to begin by yakfuruna bil taghut, then yu'minuna billah. You have to reject the tyrants 
and love and believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, the problem with the Kufans was that they kept their options open. This guy says to Imam al-Sadiq, he says to him, I love you, but I also love your enemies. He didn't say it in as many words. He said, I love so-and-so. Imam al-Sadiq said to him, here's the problem. God says in the Quran, ما جعل الله ولرجل من قلبين في جوفه. Allah has not placed two hearts inside of a man. فيحب بهذا ويبغض بهذا. You can't both love us and love our enemies. Then the Imam said to him, أما الآن فأنت أحوال. It's like someone who, whose eyes are not aligned. Someone who's cross-eyed. A person who suffers from this condition thinks that they're seeing the truth, but they might turn the other way because they're not seeing properly. Their eyes are misaligned. The Imam said to him, your, your inner eye is misaligned. You have to choose. It's either the path of Allah, the Prophet, the Ahlul Bayt. Again, these are basic things. We're not coming up with any of this from our back pockets. The Prophet said, follow my family. Okay, so if you follow the family, it's obvious what you need to do. That's one example. The other example is Imam Al-Baqir was sitting down along with his brother, Zayd ibn Ali. They were brothers. Zayd had many followers because remember Zayd was someone, and, and again, there's a whole discussion about this, but the general understanding among the scholars is that while Imam al-Baqir did not in, engage in any kind of quote-unquote political activity against the ruling uh, Umayyad regime, right? While that was the case, Zayd was in close coordination with Imam al-Baqir. So his uprising, his revolution, had the consent of Imam al-Baqir, the consent of the Ahlul Bayt. So, He's sitting with Imam al-Baqir, his own brother, in this gathering. A group of people come who pledged allegiance to Zayd and his mission. They came and they said to him, We love and follow Ali, Hassan and Hussein. Not only that, but we also disassociate from their enemies. So he said to him, good. That's how it's supposed to be. Then they said, but we also love so-and-so and we disassociate from their enemies. Zayd immediately got up and was furious. He said to them, do you know who you are turning into an enemy in the process? Fatima to Zahra. He said, when you align yourself with the enemies of Fatima, what do you expect to be? What do you expect will happen to you? بَتَرْتُمْ أَمْرَنَا بَتَرَكُمُ اللَّهِ The word butri or batri came from this expression. He says that you have severed our affair. You have denied our rights by aligning yourself with the one who, who threatened to burn down the house of Fatima to Zahra. I mean, that's the least that's been established in our own sources. We have a lot more details. But history has been redacted. History has been subjected to heavy editing. And yet we have this as, a, as an established fact that they said will burn down the house over your head and the head of your children, Hassan and Hussein. So if you associate with the enemies who made these threats, then you are alienating Fatima to Zahra. And we all know who Fatima is. Fatima to Bav'atun Minni. Man adaha faqad adhani. And so he said to them, that's not acceptable. You are now a butri or betri. You have to decide which front you're going to stand in, which camp you're going to be in. And that is one of the miracles of Ashura. One of the most incredible achievements. All it takes is a little pondering, a little retrospection. Connect the dots. It's not that hard. Figure out 
where Imam al Hussein was, what he represented, and where the enemies were, what they represented, and whose camp they were in. The problem with the Kufans was that they liked to keep their options open. And so the question about whether or not Imam al Hussein knew what was going to happen is a redundant and futile question. Of course he knew. He was there to guide people. Have we not read Surah Inna Anzalna? Tanazzalu al Malaikatu wa Ruhu fiha bi idn rabbihim min kulli amr. The Quran says that these angels descend every night of destiny. It's a continuous process, it's a perpetual descent. Tanazzalu means tatanazzalu. Not just in the lifetime of the Prophet, but every Qadr night. The angels descend with what? With every affair, meaning with God's knowledge, God's decree, what's going to happen for the next year. Who do they descend on? Who? Some child was saying a while back that, oh, the Mahdi is not a person. The Mahdi is the progression of humanity. Humans will advance and they'll learn and they'll use experiments and whatnot and they'll arrive at a state where they have perfection in this world. And then he mentioned the United Nations as an, as an example. He said, you know, the United Nations, this institution will continue to refine itself and improve and whatnot. It'll get to the point where humans are all happy and they've reached, they've achieved the pinnacle of science and social progress and whatnot. So when the angels descend with God's decree for the next year, do they descend on the UN Secretary General? Who do they descend on? Other than the family of Rasulullah, his appointed heirs. So when the angels descend on Imam al Hussein and give him details of God's decree for the next year, he doesn't know what's going to happen to him. The people who deny Ilm al Ghaib, and they have no recourse other than to deny the whole thing, by the way. So they'll deny Ilm al Ghaib from the Imams of the Ahlul Bayt, but they have to deny that the Prophet possessed any Ilm al Ghaib, right? These imposters that we see them growing like mushroom here and there. Ilm al Ghaib, the Quran says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Alim al Ghaib, God is the only one who has. Knowledge of the unseen. And yet in the very same Quran as I said last night. Read the Quran. Forget the Hadith. Alim al ghayb La yudhhiru ala ghaybihi ahadan. He is the possessor of knowledge of the unseen. And he does not expose that knowledge to anyone. Illa man irtada man rasul. Except to those messengers that he selects and he is pleased with. So, if you are willing to acknowledge, despite your incredible hubris and arrogance, that Rasulullah did have knowledge of the unseen by means of God granting him that knowledge, that's when their whole entire house of cards come, comes crumbling down. <laughs> Listen to this verse in the Quran. That is among the knowledge of the unseen that we reveal to you. So yes, God possesses knowledge of the unseen. He's the, that's knowledge that is God's. It belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But he reveals it to his messengers. He reveals it to his prophets. He even reveals it to people who are neither messengers or prophets. Like, وَأَوْحَيْنَا إِلَىٰ أُمِّ مُوسَىٰ the mother of Musa, she's a woman, she's not a prophet, she's not a messenger. She's just an average woman who happens to be the mother of this prophet. God gives her details about what's going to happen. God says, put him in a box, throw him in the river, he's going to be a prophet, he'll be okay. I mean, all these details, it's not a premonition, it's not some dream that she saw. This is revelation from Allah. But no, Hussein didn't know what was going to happen. The imams of the Ahlul Bayt have no idea what's going to happen because Ilm al Ghaib, it belongs to God. Read the Quran. Pathetic imbeciles trying to take Imama away from us. Imama, which is at the core of our faith. Imama is what connects Tawheed and Nubuwa and Ma'ad. 
Without imama, do you know what happens? Islam without imama is Yazid. Islam without imama is Karbala and the massacre of Ashura. Islam without imama is Saqifa. The whole intent of Saqifa was to attack Ghadir, was to take away our faith in imama. And that's exactly what these people are trying to do. Trying to tarnish and undermine our faith, our belief in this Quranic concept. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to the Prophet, وَإِن لَمْ تَفْعَلْ يَا أَيُّهَا الرَّسُولِ بَلِّغْ مَا أُنزِلَ إِلَيْكَ مِنْ رَبِّكَ Deliver to them what has been revealed to you by your Lord. وَإِن لَمْ تَفْعَلْ فَمَا بَلَّغْتَ رِسَالَتَهِ And if you fail to do so, then the entire message of God is invalidated. It is not acceptable unless you deliver this vital component, this last piece of the puzzle, the one thing that can keep everything together and allow this religion to flourish and allow this religion to be maintained the way it should be. So I'll leave you with this. I do apologize. Allahumma <laughs> salam. One of the people who played a pivotal role on the plains of Karbala in defense of imama, in defense of the truth, in defense of the household of purity and infallibility, despite not even being there, was Ummul Banin. She wasn't even there, was she? And yet she was because she was represented by her four sons. This lioness had given birth to three cubs, one greater than the other. She had nursed them with the love of the Ahlul Bayt in such a manner that they say Abbas never addressed his own brother Hussein as my brother. He never said, Akhi. He always said, Sayyidi, my master. Al-Hasan wal Hussein, Sayyida Shabaabi Ahlul Jannah. His honoring of his brother Hussein, his devotion to him, his commitment to him. He was the most loyal soldier of Abu Abdullah. How did that come about other than the incredible upbringing of his mother, Ummul Banin? You know how you hear that somebody's won the Nobel Prize or somebody's made it to the top of their industry or someone's, you know, being recognized as a prodigy or some, something like that, usually one of the first things people ask about is, which university did this person graduate from? Where did he come from? What's his upbringing? And in this case, the university that gave the world these unique gems was Ummul Banin. They say that when Ummul Banin married the commander of the faithful. We all know that her name was Fatimatul Kilabiyya. Her name is Fatima. And yet, when she came to the house of Amir al muminin out of concern and respect for the children of Fatima al Zahra, she said, Ya Amir al muminin I have a respect that, I have a request that you don't call me by my first name. Call me instead Ummul Banin. I know what my mission is. My mission in this life is to bring children who would be slaves and servants of the children of Fatima. Don't call me Fatima. I don't want the children of Fatima to Zahra to remember their mother every time they hear my name. And so she then gives birth to these cubs and she feeds them the love of the Ahlul Bayt, the devotion to the Ahlul Bayt, the fact that you are nothing but at the beck and call of the children of Ali and Fatima. Her aim and objective in life was always that no matter what happens, her children would always anchor their boat to the children of Fatima, to always look after them. If they ever needed anything, 
God forbid Zainab or Hussein ever became thirsty. Abel Fadl al-Abbas would always be the first one to jump. He'd be the first one trying to fetch water. Saqi Utahasha Karbala. Abel Fadl al-Abbas was brought into this world in order to die for Abba Abdullah al Hussein. Amir al Mu'mineen himself said, I want to marry a woman. I want a woman whose lineage is that of bravery and chivalry. I want someone who's going to give me children who will look after my son when he is left all alone and abandoned on the day of Ashura. Saying, Allah hal min nasir yansuruna li wajhillah. Allah hal min dhab yadubu an haram rasulillah. I want them for that day when people abandoned my son. There was a moment when the women and children looked at the enemy camp and they would see that the enemy camp is increasing by the thousands. <laughs> And yet their own camp was losing supporters and people who had accompanied Abba Abdullah from Mecca. Imagine what would happen to the hearts of the children. As Sayyid al Muqarram says in his maqtal, there is this statement which is like a dagger through my heart. He says that when Abba Abdullah al Hussein would go out of his tent on the way to Karbala every time they stood to rest, when Hussein came out, he was always surrounded by Sibyane, little children who were holding on to him. Imagine Abdullah ibn al Hassan holding the, the robe of Abba Abdullah al Hussein. Imagine Sakina al Ruqayya. These little children, he says, in fact, that when Ubaidullah ibn al Hur al Ju'fi was approached by Imam al Hussein, he himself reports this. He says, I noticed Hussein was surrounded by all of these children. Maybe one of the reasons is that these children were afraid, they were terrified, they didn't know what was going to happen. Father, why are we standing here in the middle of the desert? Weren't we supposed to go to Kufa? Father, why are these soldiers surrounding us? Why is their number increasing by the minute? But perhaps the reason was, wasn't that they were afraid of what would happen to them, but because they didn't want to lose their father, Abba Abdullah al Hussein. They didn't want to have Imam al Hussein go and not come back. Allahu Akbar. What a state of mind. So Ummul Banin prepared her children for that day. Which is why when Bishr ibn Hadlam came back to Medina and he called out, Ya Ahl Yathrib, La Muqama Lakum Biha. O oh, people of Yathrib, get out of this city. The light of Medina has been extinguished. The master of this city is no longer here. La muqama lakum biha qutil al Hussein has been killed when everyone gathered around him trying to know what he's talking about that's when he told them Hussein has been killed but there is more his body is on the plains of Karbala and his head is placed on a long spear 
That's when they say Umm al rushed out. You know, they say when Imam al Hussein left Medina, all of his relatives, all of the people that cared for him, they all came and asked him not to go. They all said, why are you going? The only one who didn't say a word to Abu Abdullah was Umm al -Baneen. She didn't tell the Imam not to go, but she did speak to her son Abbas. She might have said to him, my son Abbas, this is the day I have brought you up to face. My son Abbas, you are going with Abba Abdullah. I don't want to see you come back without him. And so she came to Bishr ibn Hadlam. What are you talking about? Tell me, how is my son Hussein? She didn't ask him about Abbas. She didn't ask him about Ja'far. She didn't ask him about Muhammad. All she wants to know is how Hussein is the son of Fatima when he told her they say that Umm al went to meet Zainab alayhi salam when Zainab came Umm al saw her some have said that perhaps Umm al greeted Zainab by saying to her my daughter Zainab my sweetheart tell me did my son make me proud on the plains of Karbala? How could Hussein die while Abbas was alive? How could Abbas have his sword and let any harm reach his brother Hussein? Zainab said, Ya Umm al -Banin. they cut off his arms before they killed him. Umm al -Banin would say, O oh, Zainab, you look like you've aged 20 years. What happened to you in Karbala? You look so much older. What did you face? What did you see over there? Baby and Tumwa Ummi. They say that Umm al would then go to the cemetery of Baqi. She created four graves for her sons. Of course, her sons were buried in Karbala, but she wanted something to go to. And she would cry to the extent that anyone passing Baqiyah would cry along with her. Even Marwan the Umayyad would cry when he saw how bitterly Umm al cried. What did she say? She would recite these verses. She would say, one day I said, don't call me Fatima. Call me Umm al -Baneen. And today I ask you, stop calling me Umm al -Baneen. La tad'uwanni wa'iki Umm al to the Kirini Biluyuth Al Harin. You remind me of my four cubs, my four sons. Stop calling me the mother of the children. And then she would say, Ya Abbas, is it true that they cut off your arms? Oh, my son Abbas, is it true that they hit you on the head with an iron pole? Oh, Abbas, is it true what they say about the arrow, Ya Hussein.